Yep, very good. Uh, good morning, Ambassador, and good evening also to those who are joining well, us from the Philippines. Okay, good evening to you, Richard. Thank very you nice so to see you. As always, Ambassador, of course, I'm looking forward to catching up with you in person soon. We used to do a lot of that back in the day, pre-pandemic days, but hopefully things mm -hmm. get uh, back to normal. Uh, well, in my case, personally, I mean, Europe has been keeping me quite busy, understandably because of the Ukraine situation and all, but I hope to get back to DC and catch up with you in person. Thank you so much again, Ambassador, for making time for what I hope to be a kind of a more in-depth discussion without taking too much of your time. And, and before going to really what has made this discussion today very relevant, which is, of course, the decision by President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Uh, to not only fully implement EDCA, but also give expanded access to the United States. And at the same time, of course, there are discussions about potentially negotiating a VFA-style agreement with Japan. We'll, go, we'll get to that uh, a little bit later on. Let me park that. But before that, can we get to know more about you, Ambassador? Because you have a quite an interesting, fascinating background. I mean, you're not um, you were you're not a career diplomat, right? As mm -hmm. far as I know, you have a very diverse background uh, that, of mm -hmm. course, are extremely familiar to us. But I'm sure a lot of our audience, Ambassador Romualdis, would love to know more about you. Can you please tell me a little bit about your background? Well, uh, as you know, actually, I, I obviously I come from a political family, but uh, my father was actually a doctor. My mother was also a doctor, and I had a brother, as you all probably a lot of people know, Dr. Kwasi. He had a funny name, but uh, that's what makes him uh, known to a lot of people. And he was the health secretary of uh, Secretary, uh, I mean, President Estrada. But um, being coming from a political family, obviously, I've been exposed to a lot of politics in our family, with my uncle being uh, the brother of my father being the uh, Speaker of the House in 1957, during the time of Carlos P. Garcia. And my other uncle, the older brother of my father, was the ambassador here in Washington, D.C. So I came here to Washington, as a matter of fact, a couple of times uh, to visit my uncle. And I stayed with him, as a matter of fact, in the embassy residence. So that exposure kind of gave me right. a feeling of what politics and at the same time. Uh, so it, it, it took a lot of interest in me, but I never wanted to be in politics myself personally. So I, um, and then I went into media, not by accident, actually. It was by accident. You know, I finished, I finished the business administration in, in La Salle. Uh, I went to Ateneo first to high school. I got kicked out. And then we went to the United States when my father was secretary general of the World Medical Association. So we lived in New York for a couple of years before I went back uh, for college. And um, uh, that exposure in terms of being uh, seen by my, my, my uh, family in politics and at the same time, uh, uh, an uncle who's the ambassador here gave me sort of like the interest in what I had. In. But my media, my coming into media, as I said, was really an accident because I was really, can you imagine if, if Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation was the, the place where I had to uh, look for a job when my father told me it's time for you to look for a job four months after my graduation. And they, they were ready to take me in. But then at that time, they have this rule that if you have somebody who's a first degree cousin, yeah. had a cousin who was working there, they said, I'm sorry, but we can't take you in. So I was, obviously I was in a panic because my father said, I'll you'll go into the streets if you don't find a job. Of course, he was kidding, but at the same time, message was clear. So I ended up uh, uh, KBS Channel 9 at that time. And uh, friends of mine, because I, I, I used to do some disc jockeying for uh, DZUW. I don't know if uh, well, you probably weren't born right, yet. Right. That was owned by uh, Jody Stewart and Emily Lawson. Yeah. So it became... 99.5 RT, actually. Right, right. So I was doing this jockey. That's how I was exposed first in media, but, you know, it's a different kind of media. So anyway, I applied in uh, Channel 9, and uh, they took me in, and uh, I became a news reporter. And being a news reporter, it was quite exciting because I got exposed to a lot of, uh, obviously, politicians. I remember my first interview was with, with Senator Jovito Salonga then. And it, right. was, it was a thrill to be able to do that. And then subsequently, when uh, uh, Senator Nino Aquino uh, right. he became the senator, I interviewed him uh, on, on one occasion for a news uh, item. Wow. And uh, 
the, the funny thing about this is that Nino Aquino knew actually my family <laughs> because my aunt, who was married to the Speaker of the House, is actually related to the Aquinos. Mm. And so when she got married to my uncle, uh, I'll show some of the photos. Related to Yeah, this was in 1938, I think, or 39, somewhere around that time frame when, when my uncle got married. Uh, no, no, this was, yeah, they were around that time because Sergio Osmeño was the, was the president then. And um, the ring bearer was Nino Aquino, and my father was the best man of my uncle. So it's, it's amazing how this, yeah. it just shows you the, the, the sort of like uh, interchange of families, even if they belong to different uh, uh, political parties. And of course, I was exposed to President Ferdinand Marcos Sr., Right. Uh, who was married to my aunt, Mrs. Imelda Marcos. So all that gave me this this, this sort of like uh, front exposure front to, yeah, front to front politics. Front. Exactly. So <laughs> and, and so I ended up uh, being interested in politics, but not getting into it. Uh, my good friend, uh, Dandin Kowanko, uh, the late Dandin Kowanko, at one point even asked me, why don't you get into politics? I'll support you. And, and says, why don't you start being a congressman in your province? I said, no, I have, I have enough cousins in politics, uh, politicians already. So I said, I'd rather be in in, in media and or, and do business instead. I think uh, you keep your nose clean, so to speak. So that's where we are. And uh, obviously that exposure uh, gave me access to uh, many presidents. And uh, President Estrada was one of the first to actually thought about making me ambassador at one point, but uh, I kind of suspected he didn't really like me because he said, I'll make you ambassador to East Timor. I said, uh, Mr. President, I don't think you like me. <laughs> you but, know. It, but it was all, all the time in the media, right? East Timor back then, the bus. This is yeah, that's right. Story. But you know, not, not, that, not, not to say anything about East Timor, but I mean, uh, obviously, he, if, if, if maybe he was kidding, but yeah. uh, he said, I'll, I'll send you to East Timor for, to be our ambassador when they just newly became an independent uh, state. So that's that's the exposure I got. And, and then, of course, as everybody knows what happened with President Duterte. He asked me to be his ambassador. I was really ready to retire because I was in business. And uh, my partners, an American uh, advertising company, uh, they were ready to buy me out, which is perfect for me because I was ready to, to get off and just enjoy life. But... Uh, I think President Duterte was quite insistent that in the end, I, I finally ex accepted the job when he said, when I because I told him, I'll do it for you, Mr. President. And he goes, don't do it for me, do it for the country. And what are you gonna, what are, what are you gonna say? What, what's your answer to that? So here I am, yeah. uh, still in Washington, DC. And President Marcos, of course, uh, uh, told me that he would uh, very much uh, like to, to have to retain me here in Washington. Right. So I'm very happy to do it, of course, for him and for the country. Right. Uh, Ambassador, before going to your uh, stint under President Duterte and, of course, now under President Marcos, I mean, this is a very exciting, interesting time in our foreign policy and our history. I mean, I can already see the outlines of your memoir, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you had this, I mean, sticker the title could be The Front Row, right? I mean, that could be your memoir. Front row. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you another thing, Richard, that uh, uh, people may not know, but I was I was only, well, how old was I? I was 17 or 16, 17, when my father, uh, who was very close to Emmanuel Pelaez, because he was, his, they, they were classmates in, at the Ateneo, and of course, my uncle, uh, the Speaker of the House, Daniel Romualdez, was obviously close to Ferdinand Marcos, the congressman then, and became a senator, eventually Senate president. But this is the this is my first exposure to politics was when my father mm -hmm. and my uncle brokered both Ferdinand Marcos Sr. and Emmanuel Pelaez right. uh, to try to join forces against then President Justado Macapagal. Fascinating. That was my first exposure. I mean, I was actually watching from right. the back of the house because you could see through our dining room where they were having that meeting. And that, that was an amazing uh, thing for right. me because I'll never forget that. Uh, and uh, well, that, that's probably the opening chapter in my book. Yeah, I mean, it's a vista, no? Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, and that's a vignette I can already see now. This is the vista you have, young and uh, idealistic and all of that. But you kind of mentioned, maybe I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, squeeze into it, but you kind of mentioned you were you were kicked out of Ateneo and then you mentioned you don't want to be in politics. Maybe these things are related. But I won't say black sheep, but maybe you were the, <laughs> I mean, how can you say, the the free-spirited one in the family. Is is that a correct way of putting it or am I overreading this? Well, no, not really. Uh, actually, we were a family of seven, but my two younger brother and sister came in uh, 10 years later. I, I was the youngest for, 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 for that long, about nine years, actually. So it was uh, not really a black sheep, but my, my mother obviously was, I was very close to my mother, but my father was a disciplinarian. And, right. and obviously when, uh, when, you know, when you're young, uh, so I got involved in all kinds of uh, uh, crazy <laughs> things at the Ateneo then. You know, those those days there we had this gang gang and I just got involved oh, in some I see, I see. You know, one of those. And so when you know when you get involved in something like that, and then of course the Jess priests were, were very angry at these things, so I was kicked out. And then uh, my father went to Father uh, Fritz Araneta then at the Ateneo, told him that you know, you're gonna have to find a school for my son because he's a you know, we're we're Catholics and we wanna put him in a Catholic school. So um, you moved up, bro. I, I, they 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 had to find him for a school for me, and and luckily, uh, quite honestly, from from Ateneo, I went to Malate Catholic School for uh, one semester, right? Because that was the Catholic school that uh, had accepted me, and and that, that to me was the best thing really in terms of uh, of it's like a um, it's like a humbling experience. Right. Uh, you're you're not in the social so-called that Ateneo La Salle thing, but bubble. you're just the simple bubble. Catholic school, yeah. So and it was good. It was a very good thing for me, and that, that sort of like put uh, put my feet on the ground and, and uh, keep keep it that way, which is uh, I think a good experience. Ambassador, you said you didn't also want to join politics. Was it was that a question of temperament or something particular that that kind of made you feel you better be the chronicler of history rather than to use the theodore roosevelt term the man in the ring you know i mean like uh, I'm, I'm just wondering i mean maybe i'm asking too much but uh, man in the ring yeah yeah the one Marin essay, know, that's theodore fine. Roosevelt, the one about yeah. that <laughs> no i you know i i really didn't want to be in politics because as i said i already had enough uh, uh, family members in politics and both my parents were doctors, so they had a different uh, view of, of what life was all about. Obviously, uh, their their life was more of saving lives, yeah, and uh, they had the, the this principle in life that you just uh, live within your means, and uh, you know that sort of thing. Right. Uh, you can help people in in your own way without having to be in, in that kind of situation. So uh, it it never really it was never really in my sort of like uh, my yeah. thinking. You know. I, I never thought about getting into uh, being a politician, although I, I was fascinated by a lot of uh, great politicians in the Philippines, and not only in the Philippines, but even here in the United States. Um, right. I, I went out of my way to beat, for instance, Richard Nixon, whom, whom I admired not because of the way things went for him, but more because he was... He was a very resilient, strong uh, president in the sense, and you know he was, uh, you know, he, uh, he told the press, "You don't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore." But he went back and became president. So he's the type of guy that will not uh, give it up. And and then when he was uh, removed from office because of Watergate, he went back again and became a respected uh, statesman, so to speak. And that was. Uh, it showed that when he was uh, when he finally died at the age of 93, when all former presidents and big politicians in the United States went to his funeral at the Orbalinda, where he was buried. Uh, Ambassador, you, you mentioned that of course you kind of had the front row to some of the major uh, you know transformations that happened in the Philippines. Obviously, one of them was the Philippines normalizing ties with China. <laughs> not long after, of course, your favorite Nixon. Normalized life in China. Can you, I mean, back then as a journalist, as a young man, how did you understand these shifting alignments and, and geopolitical uh, ch changes that was happening? Because obviously, 
we see an echo of that nowadays, right? Again, these massive geopolitical changes. But back then, what was your reading of the situation? Were you fascinated by it to see the oh, absolutely there? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked that question because yeah. that's another part of the story of my life that I, uh, when I was a news reporter, right. in 19, uh, just before we uh, we opened our uh, diplomatic relations with China, right. I was asked by President Marcos Sr. then, because I was already a senior news reporter assigned right. in Malacanang, uh, to join my uncle, who was the ambassador to the United States at that time, but he was the head of mission. But the mission then was what we call basketball diplomacy. Hmm. If you remember, I don't know if you if right, you remember right. the story about that, that we started off by having basketball diplomacy as a way of uh, starting to uh, have relationship, a relationship with China. While if you remember the United States had ping pong relation, uh, right, ping pong wow. diplomacy, we had basketball <laughs> diplomacy. So I went to uh, Beijing, the Shanghai and, and another city uh, with our basketball team then, we had uh, Sonny Jaworski, uh, Juan Fernandez, I remember that. All, all of these big players of, of our, uh, our PBA, uh, they all, we all went to, um, to China. Right. And I had the, uh, the privilege of, 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 of getting to know, uh, or at least meeting uh, Premier Sho Enlai. And right. uh, then uh, the vice premier at that time was Deng Xiaoping. Right. right. I mean, this, this is just simply uh, just, I mean, this is history right there. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I saw, you know, there was only one hotel, the Friendship Hotel in Beijing. That's where we stayed. And before that, uh, there's a cultural revolution that happened in, in China. So right. the, the hotel that we were staying in, we were say, they, they, literally there were a lot of people who died in that hotel. It was the only hotel, and uh, yeah, they said yeah. that there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, ghosts, and I felt it <laughs> to a certain extent. But but anyway, that exposure I had in China actually uh, sort of like opened my eyes and said that this is a country that is on its way to becoming a major economic powerhouse because of the number of people, and that they were starting to. At that time, I think Deng Xiaoping had already plans into opening up the United uh, to uh, China, and the rest is history. We now know what happened, and, and that's why today China has become uh, what it is, uh, an economic and uh, superpower. Right. Uh, was Zhou Enlai as charming as, uh, as many people would put it in history? You know, the way I always judge uh, a leader, quite honestly, is the way they... They shake your hand, ah, and uh, right, right. I remember Premier Sean Lai. Uh, he, he was paralyzed in one one, uh, but, right. but but when but he had the but when you he shook your hand, it was firm. Mm -hmm. It was like, and he looked you in the eye. Mm -hmm. There was eye contact. Correct. I had the same feeling mm -hmm. when I was invited to the state dinner hosted by President Duterte for President uh, 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 Xi Jinping. Uh, he had, when I met him, President Duterte introduced me to President Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping and he too had that eye contact. And for but I was already the ambassador then, so I kind of was a little bit, uh, you know, so maybe he knew who I was. I don't know. But he looked me in the eye and shook my hand and says, glad to meet you. So That's, that's interesting. Uh, ambassador, of course, one reason why perhaps I was a little, you know, not, not self-promotion, but I think I was better able to uh, foresee the trajectory of President Marcos Jr.'s foreign policies because I paid a lot of attention to the foreign policy mm -hmm. of the father, Marcos Sr. And, and he had this fascinating multi-vector foreign policy, this very strong presence in the post-colonial world, mm -hmm. of course. Let's park the domestic mm -hmm. politics. You know, we were just talking about the foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, we had this strong alliance with the U.S., but he was reaching out to China among first U.S. allies. He also had communication channels with, uh, you know, uh, Eastern European states, even directly with the Soviet Union and all. Was it apparent to you folks back then that, you know, President Marcus Jr. was kind of playing this game, no? I mean, like multiple fronts, he was moving simultaneously, charming multiple powers, but still keeping that strong alliance with the U.S. Or maybe you have an alternative point of view, because that's my understanding from reading literature and talking to people who are familiar. No, you, you're actually right, Richard. Uh President Marcos Jr., uh, actually, because of his exposure to his father. Right. And um, in fact, before the elections, I remember him telling me, uh, 
in the car. He says, everything that my father said and my father taught me is all coming back now, he said. Exactly. And this is just uh, a couple of, uh, maybe about a month or two before the May elections. And he was telling me that uh, he remembers all of that. And he, he says, I, I, I really wish my father was still around. I really miss him because mm. all those things, he was still a yeah. young man then. He was just getting into politics, being vice governor of Ilocos Norte. But he said that his father really showed what real politics was all about. And, and in, in the geopolitical uh, arena, he, he felt that his father was, uh, was also uh, very smart in the way we, he handled our relationships then. And of course, we all know that uh, President Marcos Sr. was the one who opened relations with uh, China and Russia. And Russia, so, Soviet Union. Russia. And, and, and we, had, uh, we had a very good uh, foreign policy. And of course, we had uh, CPR as the Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs then. And then we had, uh, we had, of course, Prime Minister Cesar Virata, who was well, well respected in the international community of, uh, of, uh, of the yes, yeah. economic world. So he had a very good team, team yeah. that gave uh, us uh, a place in the world, so to speak. Ambassador, of course, we'll fast forward it a little bit, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. The Philippines goes through a lot of domestic political upheaval, but nonetheless, we kept a strong alliance with the United States through and through over the past three or four decades, uh, even after the basis, permanent basis were abolished in early 1990s. So now going to the Duterte administration, obviously President Duterte came in from a very different angle, right? Because his understanding was, fine, I see the value of the alliance, but I also see probably us being taken for granted or that this alliance is not living up to the expectations of the day and that he felt perhaps it's time for the Philippines to reach out. In fact, the first time I heard the president, former president Duterte, to, to discuss this was an interview he had with Rappler. Very interesting interview he had with Maria Reso. This was the first time I really sat down and listened to him and I realized something is really different with this guy. I mean, whether I agree or not, I was absolutely sure once he becomes the president, he's going to really create big changes. And mm -hmm. uh, I was vindicated in many ways. Now, how are you processing this? I mean, did you expect there could be someone who comes in and really shakes the foundation of Philippine foreign policy, goes to Russia twice, great relationship with leaders of China and Russia? I mean, I think for many Filipinos, this was like, is this real or not, right? Or there were many people who were not, were expecting the Philippines to forever be the reliable junior partner of the United States. And then boom, you have this shock. How are you absorbing that before President Duterte uh, appointed you as the uh, United States? Yeah. No, I, 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 well, I, like I said, uh, I was, well, first and foremost, as I said, I was ready to retire from, from, from this, my business. Yeah, yeah. But um, there was also another side uh of me, but at the same time, having a lot of people, are you sure you want to really do this? Because, you know, yeah. President doesn't really like uh, the United States. And I said, well, if it's something that uh, he feels that I can be helpful, uh, then I'm, I'm willing to. And in and, and my conversation with President Duterte, I think he had a very clear mm -hmm. uh, picture on how he wanted me to play a role in his administration, being his ambassador to Washington, D.C. I think, uh, and I, I think I'm I, I would like to think that that is exactly the role I played because every time he would say anything, it would be up to me to interpret it in such right. a way that yeah. our friends here in Washington, D.C. would understand. Yeah, And that was sort of like, it, it, it kind of went that way for, for, for many years uh, after I became the ambassador here, right. uh, up to the last moment when he finally... Uh, 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 put back the, the visiting forces agreement. That was my role with him. He would criticize the United States very strongly in his own way, right. but I would give the information. I, I would be able to give our friends here in Washington D.C. what he really right. wanted yeah. to impart. Right. And I think that that message. I always bring this up because in the final months before President Duterte's uh, term ended, right. and the visit. Uh, of, of Secretary Austin, if you remember. Right. We, right. I, went, I went back to Manila after uh, of almost uh, a year and a half to two years of not being able to go back because of the, of the COVID. Yeah. And um, my advice to our friends uh, mm -hmm. here in Washington was uh, the, the people that were going to go to with, with, with Secretary Austin was do not mention the VFA. 
just give your uh, exactly. my, my advice would be for Secretary Austin to just right. simply go there, reassure our our president that uh, we are friends, whatever it is that you decide, we we are with you and so forth and so on, which which is the way I I thought would be the best. And uh, they did follow my advice, uh, thank right. God. And uh, shortly after, President Duterte uh, restored the VFA. But I also made it clear to President Duterte, uh, and and this is this is what you call real politic. Right. And right. I'll I'll share that now with you, Richard, and our friends in 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 in, in the public, that um, mm -hmm. I asked for to have a Zoom meeting with President Duterte. Uh, well, at the height of the pandemic and uh, right. we were getting our vaccines from China, which were not as effective as the vaccines coming from the United States. And the United States was holding back all their vaccines because President Biden then wanted all Americans to get it first. But we had already paid for our Moderna and also right. we had already... Uh, so I basically begged the White House to mm -hmm. give us uh, you know, to give our people uh, hope that there is there's light at the end of the tunnel that we were all waiting for. And so during that Zoom meeting, I specifically asked our Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Teddy Luxin, who's a very close friend of mine, I told him, Ted, do you mind if I'm going to be the only one that will speak? Because I really have this whole thing that I need to tell the president. And so I gave him the whole nine yards and what our relationship was and how far our relationship has gone in spite of all the... Uh, the difficulties that we have had. Uh, never in the history of our relationship with the United States did we ever get so much in such a short little time in terms of uh, military uh, assistance. Right. So I, I, I put that all down. And But the ending of my, my spiel with President uh, Duterte was very clear. I said it in Tagalog and I said, Mr. <laughs> President, and I was tearful because I really meant it, because I have so many friends who have already died. Right. I said, you know, Mr. President, maraming mamamatay sa atin. If indeed, ano. We need to give this VFA because it will help us get our vaccines to our people. Right, right. And shortly after, um, uh, Secretary, Secretary Bedeldea called me and said, the President's decided that we will go ahead and restore the VFA. So that's the story. That's right. how it happened. Ambassador, of course, I'll rewind a little bit and get again to this point because back then I also interviewed Secretary of Defense uh, Delphine Lorenzano also, of course. Yeah. Uh, we all know him very well who also <laughs> shared his two cents on what happened there. I mean, uh, for me, obviously, we saw that Secretary Austin, in fact, used the Filipino mask, you know, like, you know, it's uniquely fit. And he was very humble. He was very gracious when he was dealing. You could see the body language was everything and you could see how much that impressed President Duterte. So I, I'm... Looks like your advice probably was playing a role there. But rewind it a little bit. You became the ambassador, of course, to the United States. Also, when the United States had a leader not too dissimilar from our own, right? Because I remember mm -hmm. very well uh, in D.C., you would keep on hearing uh, a lot of people saying, well, maybe the president is not uh, super artful in his expression of certain strategic mm -hmm. points of view. But you have to understand the context. This is the implication. This is the intention. And my sense is like, this is exactly also how a lot of us try to explain um, some of the more extreme rhetoric coming from mm -hmm. the president back then. So didn't that make it easier for you? I mean, talking to your counterparts there who also had their own president to explain, right? Well, yeah, to a certain extent. But, you know, right? most, yeah, yeah. yeah, but the most important thing here, Richard, is the fact that President Duterte, in his own way, Mm -hmm. in his own peculiar way of, of doing foreign policy. The message was very clear. The United States should not take us for granted. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. I mean, we're old friends. We've been allies for, for so many years and everything like that. But do not take us for granted. And, and that, I think, that reverberated very strongly, especially with our friends in the military, at the Pentagon. And that's why... Uh, Secretary Austin, actually, in one of his uh, messages, in, I think it is his, in his Twitter account, he said that we should never take our allies for granted. Right, for and granted. that's really what it is. Uh, we were, we, we just, the message was there. And, uh, and I think that President Duterte actually paved the way for President Marcos and how we are today with mm -hmm. the United States. It's, it's, uh, it, it's worked well, actually, for uh, Setting the stage, right. Setting the stage. I mean, of course, the argument would be, 
by the time President Marcus Jr. came in, we were in a kind of a strategic sweet spot, you know, as as, mm-hmm. as I've tried to put it. But rewind yeah. a little bit, you also played a very important role in another major episode in Philippine-U.S. alliance, which is the Balangiga Bell, right? And you dealt with a different defense secretary. This is uh, Defense Secretary Mattis, right? Can you tell us a mm-hmm. little bit about that? Where do you think President Duterte was coming from? Because I actually agree with President Duterte in terms of highlighting uh, the not so good, uh, mm-hmm. you know, sort of our relationship with America. Because we, you know, I just came from Spain the other, uh, you know, week, and you know, in Spain they know it, right? We blame them for executing Rizal and doing all the horrible things. But a lot of our Spaniel friends said, and, and and sold us for twenty billion dollars. <laughs> but a lot of our Spaniel friends is like. But what about the gringos, right? It's not like they treated you fantastic, right? I mean, and they talk about Philippine-American war. One million may have died, or at least two to 300,000 by Islam. Like, but I'm my amnesia tie. We don't even talk about that. The only time I saw that in mainstream media was in General Luna movie, when you saw some scenes of uh, American soldiers, you know, roughing, in the, roughing up our Filipino counterparts. So, but I'm my amnesia. And it really, that's where President Duterte is really, you know, like unprecedented. He comes in and says, hey, this, you know, this Americanos that you know, these guys not only take us for granted, they did horrible things to us in the past, etc. So that's where suddenly Balangiga became a symbolic and also important role, right? I mean, how did you approach yeah. the ambassador? Again, this is fascinating, right? Because you had the front row in history. So I want to understand well, how you yeah, well, yeah. well, the Balangiga belts obviously was uh it's something that uh, even from the time of President uh, President Ramos. Right. Uh, it was uh, our ambassador right. then was Raul Rabe, who actually started the ball rolling, so to speak, ah. in, in trying to get those uh, those bells back. But you know, there was a there was a law in in the United States, the National Defense Act, which actually prohibits the return of any war materials uh, right. or war booty, so to speak. Right. So that law had to really be uh, be be altered, be amended, so that it will allow uh, President Trump. To be able to return those bells uh, legally, uh, it, it took a lot of effort from a lot of people. That uh, right. I give credit, of course, to to a, an American businessman, Henry Howard, who mm. spent uh, his yeah. own funds uh, to to help in lobbying for the change of that. But a lot of other people also helped. Uh, we had, of course, uh, many of those former people who were in Subic, like. Uh, Dennis Wright, uh, he was a captain in the Navy, the U.S. Navy, and he lived in the Philippines, and he he loved the Philippines, and so he was working right. hard to, to work it out. Uh, uh, I think we had uh, we had even Senator Ed Angara was actually to a certain extent responsible because Ed was very much into uh, to the history the of uh, of his province, where where there are many things that happened also during the uh, U.S. Philippine War. Right. So all of that sort of like came into play and President Duterte was able to use that whole mm. spectrum of um, of people working together in getting those Balangiga belts. And of course, his famous line during his State of the Nation address uh, where he said, return those belts, our belts. Uh, right. And I think that, that that message was very clear. And because he was precisely telling our friends here in the United States, do not take us for granted, uh, I think all that played a role in finally having those bills returned. Because if this, it was for the national interest of the United States, that for, for things like that, uh, it would help a lot in our relationship. Why not return those bills? I mean, it's useless just hanging there in, in, a, in a base in Wyoming, where I went, and I... Where Secretary Mattis was uh, very gracious to invite me, and to formally uh, uh, sort of like have a ceremonial turnover of those bills that were finally returned to our country after a hundred and one years, I think. Yeah, almost just yeah. over a century. Uh, yeah, back, so- I well, as I mentioned a while ago, I asked back then Secretary Lorenzana about what was his hunch about where President Duterte was coming from. But but from your side, did, do you think that President Duterte really wanted to get rid of the VFA or alliance, or was that real politic, to put it nicely? What do you think was going on there? I mean, uh, I don't know if you're comfortable. I mean, but, just what is your... Well, let's, yeah. let's put it this way. I think we all know President Duterte. He is the type of, uh, mm-hmm. of a leader that um, when push comes to shove, he will st- stand by with what he believes is, is mm. the right thing to do. And I think that uh, to him, if the United States 
was going to really literally, you know, when you have an ally, a strong country like the United States, and you're confronting a country like uh, China with what's happening now in our part of the world, right. certainly when you when you say that we're allies, uh, you, you expect your ally to be behind you. And I think at that time, President Duterte felt that when he looked back, our allies were not there. Mm. So what are we going to do? It's like we're on our own. And, 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 and I think he felt that way very strongly, that this VFA is, is one-sided because it's only helping the interests of the United States and it's not helping us. So it, it, it has to be reciprocal. And I think that that message, again, uh, was, very, was made clear by the president right. at, at that time. And, and I, I really believe that uh, President Duterte has changed the way the United States uh, looks at us. Uh, it's because, you know, Sometimes uh, you have a tendency to take people for granted that just because they've been around for a long time, yeah. oh, they're, they're, they're our friends. Yeah, That's not the way a relationship is. You have to work at it. You have to always make sure and, and always uh, assure the person that you, uh, that you are friends and that uh, we will continue to work together and so forth and so on. And, and I think that that message was made clear by the president, President Duterte at that time. Right. Going now to President Marcus Jr., I know I don't want to keep you too much away, but I really appreciate the, the clarification, L. Ambassador. Uh, now, going to President Marcus Jr., um, well, personally, I was, I'm not surprised by the turn of events, although I would say things are moving even faster than I thought. But um, can you explain to many people who may be, uh, you know, abroad or in the Philippines who may be kind of confused, but like, what's going on here? How did we go from president who wanted to end our alliance with the U.S. to now you have a situation whereby you know, we are not only fully implementing ETCA, but we're even expanding the American access. Isn't this too much of a big shift? I mean, this is the questions that I always get, you know, as, as a supposed expert and journalist, but I wanted to take your point of view. So is there a continuity here between Duterte and Marcus Jr.? Is that the argument here? Or is where is the continuity? Where is the change? Where is the discontinuity, if I can? Well, I think the continuity is the fact that when President Duterte left office, he had uh, reinstated the VFA. Right. So obviously, President uh, Marcos, uh, when he took office in June 30th of, uh, of uh, last year, uh, saw that as, uh, as, uh, as a way of uh, continuing the kind of relationship we have with the United States vis-a-vis -vis our mutual defense treaty and our uh, alliance. Right. And uh, we, he's very clear-eyed about this. I mean, the reality is, while he sees China as a potential economic partner, yeah. it also, he has to also walk the fine line. Yeah. And now I'd like to use, it's a, it's a laser-thin line. <laughs> right. <laughs> he has to walk Laser that uh, yeah. the laser thin line that he has to walk, uh, walk uh, that he would like very much to have a good uh, relationship with China. But at the same time, he is mandated by the Constitution to protect our territorial uh, integrity. And he made it very clear from the day he first had his state of the nation that we will not give up one inch. Mm -hmm. And he has also been very clear that uh, we do not have an issue with China. The issue is they are claiming part of our, what is ours. Right. So with that message, I think it's clear why we have this relationship now with the United States. Right. It's aligned with our interests, that our the United States is here or is with us in terms of supporting our, our territorial integrity and our sovereignty, at the same time, they are also using the Philippines as a, a, a very important uh, ally when it comes to a relationship with China vis-a-vis -vis also Taiwan. I mean, we, we, know, we all know that that's what right. it is. So it's like, now, obviously, President Marcos will not uh, go for this if it was just a one-sided affair, just like right. exactly what President Duterte uh, was communicating then when he was the president. So... I think that we are in a good place right now because I, we, we have a president who is very, very uh, attuned to the times. Mm -hmm. He knows what it is uh, in, in the geopolitical world. And, 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 you know, I'd like to, uh, you know, give me a, a it'll, it's an opportunity for me also to, to, Please, to convince our, our friends, uh, our Filipino friends that, 
all these trips that President the President Marcos is taking, but uh, since he took office, these are important trips. You know, we are. He is a new kid in the block. A lot of leaders want to meet him. A lot of people want to uh, to to see him. We have 12 million workers working outside, and they're all over the world. You cannot imagine what kind of uh, value that those trips have for the president. Uh, for, for billion, our country. Right? 62 billion. Well, dollars. you know, you, you, I, I don't even want to count it in the, right. uh, the, the economic part of it is, 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 is yet to come. Right. But the value that it has right. is that his uh, being exposed to the leaders on a person to person basis is very important for us. When he went to Europe to join uh, the meeting in Brussels, because it, uh, we were actually the co chair uh, for the right. ASEAN at right. the time, so with the EU. That was an important trip. Right. Uh, people were 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 uh, uh, criticizing him for his trip to Davos, but that was also a very good trip for him because the people that went to the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, were actually interested to find out what this new president was all about, hmm. and they came out of those meetings saying that this is a president who knows and understands economics and and what it is to open. Uh, right. our economy to the world if we are to really entice investors to come in. So these things, you know, it's it's a different thing when you have a president going out there basically uh, being the salesman. Yeah. That's, that's what President uh, Ramos did. President Ramos had a lot of trips when he was president. Right. And everybody was saying, well, why does he like to go on trips? But, you know, in fairness to President Ramos, he was able to do a lot of things as far as our economy is concerned. So that is what it is. And that we, we live in a global village. And, 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 and we all know that. What is happening in Ukraine is now affecting our economy and the economy of the world. So ha having said that, a president going to countries is well worth it. And Filipinos uh, who understand this, especially our distinguished businessmen, see the value that goes with it. Right. And, and now... Uh, mind you, uh, because of his trip to New York, and he uh, he was very articulate in, in what uh, he wanted to do for for investors to be able to entice them to come to the Philippines, and because of our new relationship with the United States, our our, our alliance, and all of the announcements of the of, of new Edgar sites, we have so many inquiries coming into our embassy now, asking uh, this and that. So, in other words. There's a lot of uh, already uh, fruits, so to speak, in, right. in, in those trips. They see President Marcos as somebody who has uh, was clear-eyed about what he wants to do for the country. He wants to bring it forward. And he says that economic prosperity was one of his main pillars of his administration. He would like to see every single Filipino to be able to have a good living in the end. Uh, Ambassador Maldis, um, do you think it also helped that the Biden administration in particular was really strong on his charm offensive also towards the Philippines. Or I, that's the impression I get. I mean, President Biden, according to President uh, Marcos, was among the first to call him and congratulate him, if not the first. Wendy Sherman, number two of State Department, is there within weeks. Then we have three cabinet members. Uh, Austin comes after two others, the Vice President Kamala Harris. Then, of course, we have the Secretary of State. I mean, I think the world is saying it's like, wow, you know, the Biden administration is really reaching out and trying to reassure uh, President Marcos that they want a relationship that is really mutually beneficial and that he will have no problem visiting the United States. I mean, you must have a weird situation, right? Because the former president never visited the U.S. And now we might see in a month or so, right? President Marcos Jr. is also visiting Washington, D.C. I just wanted to ask also about that because I, I know things don't happen in a vacuum, right? You correctly pointed out there's something about China and our frustrations with China. Probably the visit in China was not as fruitful as the president thought. But there's also something that the U.S. and our friends in Europe uh, and others have done, right, that perhaps has encouraged President Marcus Jr. to feel more reassured with not only revitalizing, but really expanding our alliance. Uh, the ambassador, mm -hmm. I mean, am, I, am I making sense here? I, mean, I, I, I would be... No, 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 you're absolutely right, Richard. I, I think that it's clear that the West, uh, specifically the United States, is reaching out to President Marcos because uh, it is it's an important country. Right. And, uh, you know, our alliance, of course, is a very important one. But, we, you know, the Philippines, President, former President Trump is the one who described it. It is 
the most expensive piece of real estate, real estate yeah. in Asia because we are right in the center. And, and that is why we Filipinos should be aware of that, that we are an important player in the Indo-Pacific region. And we are an important player in the ASEAN region and our ASEAN partners and friends. Japan knows this, Australia knows this, South Korea knows this, uh, almost any country that thinks the way we do, which is to make sure that we have our freedom and democracy intact. Uh, would like to make sure that we work in the same way, that we don't want any country to dominate another country. Uh, and, and ironically, uh, we're so close now to Japan. And remember, right. Japan was one, one of, once upon a time an enemy of the Philippines. But now we're so close that I even told the Japanese ambassador, you're in the Philippines, serving in the Philippines in one of the best times because you're now almost in the, at par with the U.S. ambassador. Right. Right, right. And, and, and Ambassador, um, President Marcus Jr. mentioned that we're looking at the tripartite security framework with our friends in Japan and U.S. Obviously, both of us are allies with the U.S., but we don't have direct alliance with each other, and that's what we're working on. I mean, you're not the ambassador to Japan, but as the ambassador to the United States, obviously, the Japan element is inevitably part of the U.S.-Philippine alliance right now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, are we expecting more announcement on this when President Marcus visits the White House later this year, or... Um, what's well, we, we, yeah, on yes. yeah. No, I, I think that we're working that out now. We're in discussions with uh, both the United States and, and uh, Japan, and even Australia is now coming into the picture. So it right. might even be a, a the quad, real, that, uh, the real it could quad. Be a quad agreement. Yes, the real quad. So, so I think that's all a, a very good development for us because we we are not leaning on just one country like the United States. In, in, in the value that we bring into the relationship and at the same time how important it is that we, we they, they recognize that we have to be uh, uh, assisted in claiming what is ours is ours, which is important for, for, to keep uh, stability in the area. Uh, so, you know, lessons learned from what's happening right now in Ukraine. We don't want the same thing to happen in our part of the world, definitely. So I think all countries now are beginning to realize that how important it is to always have this type of relationship with countries who think in the same way. Right. Freedom last, and democracy. Last point, uh, Ambassador. Thank you so much again for really giving a lot of context here. Um, last point. There are, of course, some people are critical of the direction of President Marcos' foreign policy because... The argument is essentially twofold, right? Which is one, we're actually risking becoming more of a Ukraine. Obviously, I have my big problem with that kind of argument, but I wanted to hear your point of view on this, which is, you know, we are dragging ourselves into the Taiwan issue and we're exposing ourselves to that. And, you know, a lot of supporters of the former president kind of make that argument. And then on the second front, this is more the progressive groups, right? Their argument is, oh, this is going to make the Philippines much more dependent on the United States. And in a sense, it's going to undermine our sovereignty. I, I mean, I have made my own ton of arguments on this, but I really want to hear your point of view, Ambassador. What do you tell to these people who say, actually, mapapahamak tayo dahil dito sa EDCA expansion. Bakit pa in-expand? Sana na-implement lang, hindi na binigay yung mga bases sa North. Of course, they're still undisclosed, but our expectation is in Isabella and Cagayan. And then yung argument na, edi lalo tayo maging dependent sa Amerika. Eh, anong klaseng independent foreign policy yan? What do you have to tell those critics, uh, Ambassador? Well, uh, like I said, <laughs> these are the real geopolitical situation that we, we're facing. Right. Uh, our alliance with the United States obviously is a very important one because of wh where we are today and what we face. Uh, whatever we're doing now is a lot of it is really a deterrent of what we what might happen if there is a conflict that may arise between the United States and China and. And, and let's really be realistic. You know, if anything happens, for instance, in Taiwan, do you honestly believe that we are going to be isolated from that? Right, right. Absolutely not. And we have to learn from the from uh, lessons of history. Right. Remember what happened during the World War II when the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, didn't want to get involved in the war at first. Right. And Churchill 
Winston Churchill came to Washington, D.C. so many times to plead with the United States that they must be part of the effort to try and blunt uh, Adolf Hitler at that time. And uh, Churchill was right. And, the, uh, and, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, finally acceded to it. And the United States was brought into the war, even if they were not uh, directly, uh, right. except, of course, what happened in 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 uh, Hawaii, where the Japanese had to be bombed uh, Pearl Harbor. But the fact of the matter is that, again, we live in a global village. The bottom line for us is this. Which side do you want to be? Do we want to have a, a country where we have freedom and democracy, which everybody's always claiming that that is very important for us, that we don't want to have an autocratic rule, and we don't want this and that and that? Then this is what it is. We so are make a choice, Ambassador, because some are saying well, to, a, to a certain extent, it's a choice between what uh, kind of system of government do you want? An auto, autocratic government, or do you want a free and uh, open and democracy? Democracy. We have chosen to be an open democracy. Our, our constitution is almost patterned after the United States, and, and that we keep it that way because they believe the Filipinos want to have that kind of system in our country. That's really what it is. It, it can't be anything else. Right. You know, any leader will not go into any kind of alliance if he feels that it's not really good for the country. I mean, and I can tell you this uh, straightforward. Mm -hmm. This president that we have right now, uh, believe it or not, is, is very, very focused on what he thinks is best for the country. He has no other ambition but to do good for the country for obvious reasons. And like I always say, he ran for president because he had only one thing in mind, to prove that he and obviously the family are not what, what people have, uh, have made pictured them to be. Is that uh, it, it is a leader that wants to do his part for the country and he loves the Philippines. He could have lived abroad uh, like many other uh, sons of, uh, of former presidents, but he chose to live in the Philippines. And he chose to, to run for president, not because of any other ambition, but to do good for the country. And I am convinced that he will be a good leader, a good president, and history will judge him that way. And, and that is what I think that many people in our country should realize, that if you have a leader that's been voted in by a large majority, then you support him. And then if he does something wrong, then you, you criticize him by all means, uh, say so. That's why we live in the democratic world. But, uh, but to criticize him because of his name or because of, of, of this and that, I mean, that's, it's like you're shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, what good will it do, really? I mean, is it going to help you in, in the future? We have so many people who are, who are saying that if he becomes president, they're going to migrate. Then that, that is your own free will. But why? This is our country. This is our country. We fight for our country. That's what we are for. And that's the reason why I'm here in Washington, D.C. And not because I want to have the glory of being an ambassador. That's, that's, that's beyond already. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say how old I am, but at my age... <laughs> We don't need that anymore. We, what we want is you just to do You age at all, Ambassador. You didn't age at all. all there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. But uh, I'm way, way past my bedtime, so, so to speak. But I'm, I'm doing this because I really love our country. And I want, I want this president to succeed. And I want our country to be really a strong country uh, and, a, and, and a, uh, uh, really a partner, not, not as a dependent of the United States, but a partner of the United States. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for that. Sorry, let me just squeeze in a slight question. Are we also going to see uh, ETCA expediting or facilitating more transfer of uh, weaponry? Because we're talking about AFP modernization here, right? I always say the ultimate goal should be strengthening our own minimum uh, defense capability. Oh, absolutely. Incredible defense absolutely. Capability. Yeah. Absolutely. The meeting that President uh, Marcos had with President Biden was very clear. President Biden said, you tell us what you need so that we can help modernize your armed forces, so we can help your economy to, uh, to, to become prosperous, 
And, and that's why we have all of these things that are happening right now. I've never seen so much activity really in Washington, D.C. Right. as I, I see right now. And, and I'm so happy to see that. I mean, it's a lot of work for me, but, but at the same time, I think that that's really something that I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. All of these things are all going to come into play with us uh, down the road. And, and certainly I, I'd like to be able to be around to be able to see our country really economically prosperous. And, uh, and our relationship with the United States, uh, uh, having been able to be a part of that. And of course, our armed forces. I have a lot of uh, our, many of our armed forces uh, officers come here to, to Washington, D.C. And they're all gung-ho about a lot of things that are going on between our two countries, the cooperation and all of the things that uh, we're looking at to be able to modernize our armed forces. And we are going to be a strong uh, country that we will be able to uh, to carry our own weight, so to speak. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I'm glad to see you keeping strong and keeping fresh in many ways. I know you have a lot to do, so wishing you the best for the rest of the day, and, and I'm, I hope to catch up with you in person and also more conversation as more big things are going to happen, including the upcoming visit to the White House by President Marcus Jr., right? Well, I, I look forward to seeing you here, Richard. Uh, you're I'm one of your fans, so I'll, I'll always I always watch whatever you do, and I read everything that you 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 write. So I, I look forward to seeing you here, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, to express my uh, my thoughts on on our relationship with the United States. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and expect also getting quoted in <laughs> a lot of my upcoming writings and all as always the record. Mm -hmm. Have a good day, Ambassador, and talk thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you again. Adios. Adiós.